important at eight o'clock in the morning. And um, I was thinking about that experience uh, because you, I once heard you talking to a Jewish audience about you were describing for them how you got into the kind of work that you do as a Jewish scholar who studies the New Testament and spends a lot of time talking to Christians. And you actually had an exposure to a kind of Christianity as a child that would have seemed very alien to me as someone from a small town in North Carolina who was not raised in the Episcopal Church, even though I'm an Episcopal priest now. Um, I mean, when I was a child, I, I did not personally know anyone who was Jewish. I knew only, I was only aware of one person who was a Roman Catholic Christian. And all I really knew about him was that he had a lot of brothers and sisters. Uh, but, you, but you explored the Catholic world of your friends um, interestingly, with the blessing of your parents, uh, not in order to become Catholic, but in order to understand what was going on there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really fascinating. Sure. Um, clearly, I lucked out in the parent department. Um, I, I may live right now in Nashville, Tennessee, and I did do my graduate work at Duke, which is where Fred Horton went. Um, but I grew up in southeastern Massachusetts, so rural economically depressed right on the Atlantic Ocean. So it was gorgeous, but it, it was not like the intellectual capital of the world. Uh, pretty much everybody in my neighborhood was Portuguese, Roman Catholic. Um, so I'm fluent in Catholic because I grew up with Catholics. I used to go to mass with my Catholic friends. If you had a sleepover on Saturday night, everybody got trotted to mass on Sunday morning. That got me out of Sunday school in the synagogue, which was great. Um, and then this one day, this little girl said to me on the school bus, you killed our Lord. And I responded, I did not kill anybody. Because if you killed somebody, you would know. And she said, yes, you did. Our priest said so. So this is the thing about clerical collars, uh, uh, one of which you are wearing. And these things make me a little bit nervous to this day. Um, so I said, no, I didn't. She said, the priest said so. I thought the reason priests had to wear these special collars, and rabbis did not, by the way. They just wore like a suit and tie. The priests had to wear these special collars because were the priest to tell a lie, the collar would choke the priest which if you think about it is actually a splendid idea. It would make religious services much more interesting, you know, across the Catholic spectrum. Right. Um, uh, so I said, is the priest dead? Because this had to be such a whopper of a lie, the caller would have choked the priest and eh, that's it. Um, and she said, no. So I being a rational child think, okay, the priest said I killed God, the caller doesn't kill the priest. Therefore, I must be responsible for the death of God. So I get off the school bus, early 1960s, I'm crying. My mother meets me at the bus and says, what's wrong? I said, I killed God, right? Because the priest said so on the collar didn't kill the priest. So it took my mother a little bit of time to figure out what had happened. But when she 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 finally understood what, 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 what had happened and she assured me that God was still fine. Mm -hmm. Good news. Um, and as I found out later, made a few phone calls to appropriate offices. Um, something called Vatican II had already started, but among the final documents of Vatican II, so October, 1965, this now tells you how old I am. Um, uh, or more or less, uh, it was a document called Nostra Aetate, Latin for in our time, that said one cannot hold all Jews at all times responsible for the death of Jesus. That was then, this is now, and there, there is a distinction. Um, and that creates a sea change in Catholic religious education, then filters down to a number of other denominations. Um, I could not fathom how Catholicism, which my parents told me was very much like Judaism, like you worship the same God, the one who created heaven and earth, and you pray the same prayers, like the Psalms, and you take authority from the same set of texts, like Genesis or Isaiah. I thought Christians had to work harder because they had more books in their Bible. Yeah. Because right? I had seen <laughs> Catholic Bibles at my friend's house, and it's much longer. Right. And my parents also told me that a Jewish man named Jesus was very important to my Catholic friends. So I couldn't figure out how this tradition that had so much in common with my tradition was suddenly saying horrible things about me. Um, so I announced to my parents, you can tell I'm an only child. I announced to my parents, I wanted to go to religious education classes, to catechism classes with my Roman Catholic friends to find out where this hateful teaching came from because I'm gonna stop it. Um, I thought it was a translation problem because I went to Hebrew school in the next town and we were learning Hebrew. And my parents, and I said, I lucked out in the parents department, my great parents said to me, as long as you remember who you are, go, you might learn something. It's good to know about other people's religions. Mm -hmm. So I'm seven years old and I'm starting to go to church school. And I loved it because the stories that I heard were like the stories that I was hearing in synagogue. And sometimes they were the same stories. I mean, you have Abraham, we have Abraham. You have Moses, we have Moses. And then you get all this extra stuff, which was very Jewish to me. Um, and nobody ever said anything that was anti-Jewish or hateful or anything like that. 
so that when I finally sat down and read the New Testament as many years later, and I'm continuing to go with my friends to their religious right. education classes, I, two things occurred to me. The first thing that occurred to me was the New Testament is Jewish history and it's stuff that we didn't get in the synagogue. So the first person in literature ever called rabbi is Jesus of Nazareth. The only Pharisee from whom we've got written records is Paul of Tarsus. This is right. my right. history. And the other thing that occurred to me, uh, and I did not have the language for it at the time, was that we choose how to read. So you can read the New Testament, and come out hating Jews, but you can read the New Testament and come out not hating Jews. And I was curious as to what that mechanism was. So you read kindly and graciously rather than with hatred. And I thought, if anybody can teach me what that is, we now know that's called hermeneutics. But if anybody could teach me what that is, I, I want to be able to teach other people that so that Jews can read the New Testament and recover our own history and not get put off by some of the more difficult passages, but understand them in their context. And Christians can read the New Testament and not come out as hatred, hating Jews and not bearing false witness against Jews and Judaism. So I figured I'd make this a career and, and if nobody hires me, I'll go to law school. But you know, the career thing seemed to have worked. So uh, let me ask you about this. Um, you know, I, I was really fascinated by the your most recent book that you co-authored with um, with Mark Brettler called The Bible With and Without Jesus, How Jews and Christians Read the Same Stories Differently. And it's getting at some of the things you were just talking about. Um, I think that one of the things that would surprise many people that I'm usually hanging out around, most of them to Christian to, to one degree or another, is that uh, that in explaining how Jews and Christians read these same stories differently, y'all do not discourage very Christian ways of reading, say, the, the Christian Old Testament. I want to come back to that, even just using that phrase in a second. Uh, in fact, perhaps counterintuitively to some, y'all encourage Christians to be, you know, perhaps even more bold than they are <laughs> in reading those texts through the lens of their own religion, while showing them that other people are wearing different spectacles, you know, to read the same words. And so, you know, there's a lot of ways we can talk about that. But I'm curious even about how we refer to the Bible itself, you know, uh, is it okay for Jews and Christians to um, to uh, use different terms to refer to the Bible or parts of the Bible? Because, you know, as you know, some people would feel better if we used a common term, but really the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament do not refer exactly to the same thing in, in a lot of different ways. So how do you think about some of the different terms for the Bible itself, even just starting there? Yeah, it's a fair question. Uh, when I went to graduate school, which was back when Noah was still on the ark, um, I was told, do not use the term, this by Christian faculty members, right. Right? do not use the term Old Testament because old is marginalizing and demeaning. So you need some sort of neutral term, which is non-confessional, uh, like Hebrew Bible or Hebrew scriptures. So, you know, I listened to my professors. So for a while I was on like the Hebrew Bible bandwagon. Right. But the more I thought about it, the more I, th I really don't like this because it presumes some sort of default where we're reading the same text through the same lenses with the same translation, with the same canonical order, with the same right. reception history, and we're not. Moreover, Hebrew Bible is really a Protestant term. So for people in the Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Eastern Orthodox communions, which means you all, right. they sound so Southern, you all, <laughs> pops out every once in a while, um, uh, your Bibles have Greek stuff in, in them like the books of the Maccabees, because in the weird way the world works, the church kept the books of the Maccabees. Jews got the holiday of Hanukkah, fair trade. You have the book of Judith, you have the book of Susanna, you have the wisdom of Solomon. These are not in Hebrew, these are Greek texts. So if the idea is to make Jews feel better than the idea of using Hebrew Bible, then it's simply basically tossing the various Catholic communi communions under the bus. Um, and what I want to do is preserve the differences. So if you say Old Testament, then I know we're talking about Christian Bible right. part one begins with Genesis, ends with Malachi, right? Um, and then there might be some other stuff thrown in there. Um, and then you start off with New Testament and they're both testaments. How nice. Um, old does not mean remaindered, put up on the shelf, you know, dusted twice a year. Old is foundational, bedrock, important, essential, uh, like that old time rock and roll, because I don't think there's really been anything good since about 1986. Um, so it's old, is, I'm old, yeah. old is fabulous. <laughs> and for, to talk about the Jewish canon, I would much prefer to use Tanakh, which is an acronym for Torah instruction, sometimes translated a lot, but it really means instruction, which is the Pentateuch, the Nevi'im, which are the prophets, 
um, and the Ketuvim, which are the writings. So actually the Christian Old Testament has four parts to it. The Jewish Tanakh has two parts. And we don't end with the prophets. We tuck the prophets right. in the middle. We end with the edict. We end with Second Chronicles, which is a good text to put at the end. Um, it's the edict of King Cyrus of Persia telling the Jews in Babylon, "Go home." Right. And it's a much different message. If you end with the prophets, then you get promise fulfillment. If you end with "Go home," you don't need to move to the New Testament. You simply go back and you read it again. So right. So, yeah. These different terms. I, I love this whole thing about the, the ordering of the books because Malachi is a beautiful prelude to the to the to the way the Christian ordering of the of the rest of the books are, uh, but but it makes sense that it's that it's different and I mean it, so it affects how you tell the overall story right I mean or or the part that you emphasize I and even even. Um, uh, you know, with Christians placing emphasis on the four gospels within the New Testament or Jews placing emphasis on the first five books of the Bible. Um, you know, again, that affects how you read things. And I, and I love something that what your co-author mentioned in an interview you all did together, uh, which I thought was actually helpful to probably people that I hang around with, that, that if you think of the various texts throughout the Bible written in different sized fonts, um, that whereas passages from Isaiah might be in an enormous font in Christian circles, but just, you know, like 11 point kind of regular print in Jewish circles. And, but then like the book of Esther would be, be the, exactly the opposite. Um, and you, you have lots of variations of that. I, I, I found that to be kind of a helpful visual way to think about, you know, why, why are we, why are we skipping over certain parts or why are we gravitating toward other parts? Um, how do you think about that? I mean, I think, yeah, I think Mark Brettler's metaphor of the 40 point font versus the three point font is extremely helpful. Um, it's also that case within the broader Christian community. And there are some churches for whom the book of Revelation is like huge. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Matthew's beginning, maybe not so much. Um, so we're all setting up canons within canons. But I also think this is helpful when we read together, which I think is a good exercise. So we can see through each other's eyes. Um, oh, Jews look at Isaiah 7, 14. This is the, the, what underlies Matthew's, behold, a virgin will conceive. That's the Greek translation. We never hear that in our liturgy. It just simply right. drops out. Um, we spend a lot of time with the book of Numbers. If you get your Bible delivered to you on Sunday morning to the lectionary, <laughs> Numbers just kind of goes missing. Right. Um, so we start reading together. I think that's helpful. And what, what sometimes, many things annoy me. Like I get annoyed very easily. One of the things that annoys me is um, faculty members who teach um, Hebrew Bible and insist that Christians check Jesus at the door. Right. Um, so everything has to be exactly historical. Right. On the other hand, you can read the text through a feminist lens or a womanist lens or a post-colonial lens. The one lens you can't use is the Christian lens. And that seems silly to me. Um, so I, as a Jew, will see things in the Tanakh through rabbinic lenses um, and I think the Christians should have the same permission to see Jesus on every single page of the Old Testament, because that's traditionally the way the Old Testament, again, using Christian terminology. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, that's a good segue into, you know, one of the things that I've always loved about the Angli about Anglican Christianity, of which the Episcopal Church is a part, is the, is the regular use of the Psalms, both in daily worship, uh, daily prayer, and in weekly corporate worship. And so the Book of Common Prayer, for example, includes the entire Psalter, all the whole Book of Psalms, not a selection of them. You know, we, we wait for the lectionary to, 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 to weed it out a little bit, but, but it's actually all there in the prayer book. Uh, and so, you know, as you said, most Christians are going to see Jesus in the words of, of parts of those Psalms, not because the name of Jesus appears there, but because some of the images remind us of the Jesus we meet in the New Testament and of the Jesus we know in our lives as Christians. But, but there are other Christians that in our same circles who resist that kind of reading because they think that, that you, you will be offended by it. And so in order to love you, they would ask me not to do that. You know, and I, it, just, it seems like we, we, we get ourselves tangled up in these knots um, of wanting to be sensitive to the other and, and, kind, and, a, and sometimes make a little bit of a mess for everybody in the room. Yeah, um, I, I don't think Jews own the text. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the the first people who read it through Christian lenses, I mean, and the term Christian here would be anachronistic, like right. Paul who doesn't yes. know the word or the gospels. Yeah. They don't know the word Christian. Uh, but the, those first followers were all Jews. This was their scripture. This was the scripture of Jesus. So it's not surprising that as Jews, they would say, well, if, if Jesus is our Lord, which these people did because they had experienced him as resurrected, then of course they would find him in the scripture. And the, and the rabbis, meanwhile, are saying, well, how do we understand our existence when the temple has been burned down or when we've, we've been forced into diaspora, thrown out of Jerusalem? And we go back and we read through rabbinic lenses. Everybody does that and nobody owns it. So it would be nice if instead of looking at religion as some sort of zero sum game, oh, it means this, then it cannot mean that. To say, if you read through Christian lenses, you're going to get this. And if you read through rabbinic lenses, you're going to get that. What happens if we read together? Mm-hmm. So that what I, when I work with Jewish groups who will sometimes say to me, well, I don't understand how Christians can see the Trinity in Genesis, or I don't understand how Christians can see Jesus in Isaiah, to say, well, here's what it looks like through a Christian lens. And they go, oh, there's a logic there. It may not be one you'd want to follow because right. you've got your own logic, mm-hmm. but at least now we can have respect for each other and see that people aren't just willy nilly inventing stuff but they're reading through their own experiences. And that's something to be understood rather than rejected. And, and the Bible itself, I, I, mean, I think about this, especially in the Old Testament, like it, it testifies within its own pages about retelling stories and repurposing them for the present moment. Like, like you actually see that happening, you know, like in the way that we actually do in our own traditions or in our own lives. And uh, one of the points that I think you and Mark had made about the Psalms, that the, they're seem to be an example of parts of the Bible that were not, they were not originally written as prophetic texts, but they become prophetic texts at a later point in time. And, I, and, I, and is this correct to say that that happens not only in Christianity, but it even happens within Judaism? Is that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So we, we, we kind of play with a genre. Right. So we have a psalm, which is originally a prayer, and then somehow we say, oh, well, that reminds us of something later. So suddenly the psalm becomes prophetic. Uh, Matthew repurposes lots of stuff, right, as we move up toward toward Advent, toward Christmas, um, with all those so-called fulfillment citations. This was done to fulfill what was said by the prophet. You know, and nobody else was thinking that at the time, but Matthew, reading retrospectively, says, oh, this reminds me of Jesus, so I'm just going to bring it forward. Mm-hmm. You have similar things in rabbinic literature. You have similar things in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Nothing wrong with that, because what they're doing is they're making the text relevant to their own time. Um, If we only look at the Bible as an historical document, we can get a PhD and and teach in a public university. But if we want to look at the Bible as a text that is somehow authoritative, the Tanakh for the synagogue and the Old and New Testaments for the church, then it cannot only mean what it meant in its original context. It has to have meaning for the contemporary church. So you go back and you see things that you might not have thought of back then, or they never thought of. But the text still speaks to you today, which is why devotional Bible study still works. And that happens in our own lives, doesn't it? I mean, you know, different chapters of our lives, we're suffering in some more than others, or, or we're going through different experiences. So we go back and read the same words ourselves, and they, and they, they say something different to us because we're at a different point in our life. Absolutely. I, this is one of the things I tell my students. If you read a text when you're six and you read the same text when you're mm-hmm. 60 and it means the same thing, right. something has probably gone wrong and it hasn't gone wrong with the text. Right. So that every time I teach a course on the Gospels or on parables or on Acts or on Genesis, I'm always seeing new things um, because I'm reminded of some other text that I hadn't brought to bear on that the text that I'm reading. Or my students ask me questions that I had never thought of. Mm -hmm. Great question. Now let's try to figure out if we can find an answer. So the text is ever going to have new meanings. And that's a good thing for you because you're clergy. Because if it didn't, every every third year, you'd be (laughs) preaching exactly the same sermon and there'd be somebody in the church would notice. (laughs) We actually did a class uh, here where um, Roger as an artist was helping with with the artistic side of this, but we, we focused on Psalms and then, you know, and read a Psalm and talked about its meaning of it. Then people made some kind of artwork that was for them personally, how they were hearing this song or how they were experiencing that or what it made them think about. And that was a, that was a great exercise and also a little bit uh, get people out of kind of the normal way that they engage a text. Um, I have a question that, um, and I know, and I've heard you talk about this in a lot of different contexts. Um, 
you know, I, I serve a parish here that is, is really interesting, is simultaneously very inclusive, celebrating the gifts and the relationships of LGBTQ plus Christians in the pews and the pulpit and in leadership roles. But we are also very traditional in our forms of worship. We like a lot of ritual. We use incense. Uh, we preach grace through Christ from the pulpit. Uh, we say the words of the Nicene Creed unapologetically. You know, I especially like the part where it describes Jesus as God from God, light from light, true God from true God. But there are a lot of mainline uh, Protestant Christians, including Episcopalians, who either they wrestle with that themselves, you know, uh, what they're wondering, you know, what does this mean or how do I want to talk about this? Or, um, or they want to find something else that's distinctive and that sets Jesus apart from the crowd. What is, you know, what's this, you know, scandal of particularity about yeah. Jesus and Christianity. And so what they, and, and, and they want to make Jesus appealing either to themselves or to outsiders. And so they, they, what they end up doing is they'll talk about Jesus reaching out to women and breaking the social norms of his day, or Jesus introducing an ethic of love as the most important guiding principle, you know, all of these kinds of things and, and I know kind of where this is coming from, but then what is often the unintended consequence of, of making this kind of shift sort of on the liberal side of, of things? Yeah, it, thank you for the question. If the idea is to make Jesus your, your go-to social justice warrior, the easiest way to do that is to make first century Judaism look toxic. And then Jesus becomes the only Jew. So this is the right. unique Jesus and unique here is a theological category. Mm -hmm. So if you can't accept that he's, you know, born of a virgin, um, walked on water, raised the dead, died, came back and ascended and will return. If all that goes out, it's all like metaphor. Mm -hmm. Then how do you make him unique? You make him the only Jew who cares about social justice, women's rights and health care. Um, and it's it's a it's a lazy move. Um, it's a disrespectful and often dishonest move. And what it winds up doing is making Judaism, making people I, either more anti-Jewish than they already are from the general culture, because there's this systemic anti-Judaism as there is systemic homophobia, heteronormativity, racism, and so on, um, or inculcating anti-Jewish views. Boy, those Jews, they were just awful. Um, I, I once had a student say to me, Wow, love of God and love of neighbor, what an original idea. I'm thinking, uh, no, that's Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Right. <laughs> and these are important statements in Jewish tradition as well. Um, or the golden rule, how original? No, it's all over the place. So it's a theological problem. If you're high church and you can say the Nicene Creed and understand what you're saying and actually think about it, um, you don't have to make Jesus unique in social justice stuff. It's also a failure to pay attention to your own Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You want social justice stuff? Read Deuteronomy, read Amos. It's all there. Well, I have a question related to that. You, this is a great segue to this, because as you know, uh, there's a heresy within early Christianity called Marcionism, which rejects the everything in the Old Testament. And, and it is not something about ancient Christian history, because it is alive and well in our own day. And I mean, you can you can certainly meet more than a few Episcopal priests, for example, who never preach a sermon on anything um, from the Old Testament. And, and I have had more than one, I, I would say, extremely liberal-minded Christians say to me something like, you know, I just don't see any grace or anything loving uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And I always think, well, my friends who are rabbis in the Reformed tradition seem to keep finding lots of these kinds of things in their scripture. So I, I think a lot of us have heard a variation of this, these kind of ideas expressed by contrasting, you know, a so-called God of wrath in the Old Testament mm -hmm. with the God of love in the New Testament. So I'm sure you are not infrequently <laughs> confronted by this. How do you, how do you respond to people who sincerely believe that i mean they really don't kind of know how to make their way through the maze or something they, they they really they really are they really do struggle with this and they don't know how to get out of it yeah um there's a scholar named eve morosa who actually did a chart on here are the grace parts in the old testament right. here are the grace yes. parts in the new and and like the old testament is much, granted it's a longer text it's a much longer list um, it's a failure to read, and it's a failure to read graciously. Um, you want grace. Oh, let's start with Adam and Eve, right? So the, the thread is the day you eat this fruit, dying, you will die. Motamutu, the infinitive absolute, you'll drop dead. They live for another couple of centuries. I mean, you know, um, Cain, right? He kills somebody. 
he gets a mark of protection. It's kind of like Glinda the Good Witch, you know, giving Dorothy this mark of protection. I mean, Golden Calf was not one of ancient Israel's better moments, and, and God's still with us. It's extraordinary. Um, so when I get this nonsense from my students, I first point out that it's a heresy. Well, they don't care. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> and then I say, well, okay, let me give you an example. Um, and I just proof text. When in doubt, drag a text out of context. So the God of the Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd who leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. But you are condemned to the outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. In other words, I have a good shepherd. You have a sadistic dentist. You want God on a bad day? Have a look at, I don't know, Mark 13 and then flip to the book of Revelation. This is nonsense. The God to whom Jesus prays when he says, Abba, Father, that's the same God to whom Jews have always been praying. And when Jesus teaches his followers to pray, our Father who is in heaven, or if you must, who art, um, <laughs> that, that's, 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 it's the same God um, who is incredibly gracious and incredibly merciful, but is not inclined to let social sin go unremarked. Mm -hmm. It's the same God. And again, if you have to toss the Old Testament or Judaism under the bus, in order to make the New Testament or Jesus look good, that's pathetic. And I think Christians can do a whole lot better. And what do you think of the, um, the you know, I've, I've sometimes described the relationship between Judaism and Christianity as, um, you know, there's this multiple forms of being Jewish in the first century. There are two forms of that that survive you know, beyond the destruction of the temple, what becomes rabbinic Judaism and what becomes um, Christianity, because I think a lot of, if American Christians ever think about this, we often think of kind of like a mother-daughter relationship. In a way, we're really more Christ, we're more cousins uh, to one another. Is that is that a fair analogy? Yeah, I, I think mother-daughter, because the father-son metaphor got picked up elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, like, we, like we have a, we have a common you know, grandparents in a way or something like that uh, um, more than... Years ago, um, a scholar now deceased named Alan Siegel wrote a book called Rebecca's Children. Like two nations are in your womb and, they're, and, and they're, they're struggling with each other. So rabbinic Judaism saw itself as descended from Jacob and Esau as the Christian church. And the Christian church saw itself as Jacob and Jews as that older brother who didn't quite get with the program. Um, so then this is that problem of trying to claim the heritage just for ourselves. Right. Um, yeah, so we start out as siblings of a sort, uh, but what happened was, um, and this happens by the end of the first century, is the church, if we can even use that term, right. uh, the followers of Jesus are becoming increasingly Gentile majority, Jewish minority, and by the second century, they're beginning to lose, and you can see this with Ignatius of Antioch, they're beginning to lose their, their Jewish connection. Because Paul told his, and remember, Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. He says, hi, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. So we know, like, who's at his table. Mm -hmm. um, his job is to convince these Gentile new believers in Jesus um, that they are now under covenant with God. They are adopted in. That's his language of adoption. Adoption in antiquity was really important because adoption meant somebody picked you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and they have the same, the same connection to God that the Jews do. Um, but they're not supposed to convert to Judaism because if they did, then the only people who would be worshiping God would be Jews. But for Paul, it's the Messianic age. And in the Messianic age, the Gentiles turn from worshiping their gods, we call pagan gods or idols, whatever term you want to use. Um, and they turn to worship the God of Israel. Um, Zechariah predicts the day when 10 Gentiles will grab hold of the coat of the Jew and say, take me with you to Zion you know, so we can worship your God. But they don't say circumcise us when we get there. So it's an original sense of Jews remain Jews and Gentiles remain Gentiles, and they have different practices because it's not a melting pot, but they all worship the God of Israel. Well, the Jews aren't signing on with the program. So more and more Gentiles come in and they're not under the law. And then they start reading Paul as applicable to everybody, Jews and Gentiles combined. And the early followers of Jesus could not figure out why these Jews who have the scriptures of Israel and for them would have seen those messianic prophecies that until Jesus weren't read as messianic prophecies. You know, why aren't they signing on to the program? So Paul says, oh, it will happen. All Israel will be saved. It'll happen. A hardening has come upon Israel now. It's okay. God will take care of them. If, if the church had just read with Romans 11, everything would have been fine. 
Matthew suggests they're misled by their leaders, but that only carries for a generation. Right. John it starts getting into this idea of, well, they're Jews, they're children of the devil, they were never fated to get it, they represent the world, and they're not part of this chosen group. And some of that negative material about Jews and Judaism, which does show up in the New Testament, becomes normative for the church. As part of this, and I've, I've, I have a men's Bible study that meets early on Tuesday mornings, and sometimes, you know, I've I spend a lot of time talking about Pharisees and Jesus talking with the Pharisees and Jesus being Jewish, arguing with the Pharisees, uh, but also about some of the intensity of some of the things you were describing. And I say, you know, it's like in our own traditions, when the Anglican communion was having, you know, fights in the kitchen about different things, there was an intensity to that that was different than if you have a disagreement with a storefront Pentecostal church down the street. This is family fights are, are, are have an intensity about them. Yeah, is some of that what is happening, you know, that's some of it, um, yeah. sibling rivalry, or for those of you who do psychology, what Freud would call the narcissism of minor differences. The closer you are, the more you struggle <laughs> right. to self-define yes. over against the other. Um, so I'm, I've now said my intellectual thing for the night. Um, some of it, I think, is just internal apologetic. I hate them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how people define themselves. Um, and the tendency to demonize others. I mean, we, we see it in, in so-called uh, American political discourse today. Sure. Um, so how do you define yourself? You, de you project onto the other, everything that you don't want to be. Um, there's a new book coming out that I edited with a fellow named Joseph Siebers, who's retired now from the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome called simply The Pharisees. It's coming out from Erdman's Press. Mm -hmm. Um, in late November, early December. And it's based on uh, the seminar papers given at, at a conference that was done in Rome in 2019, basically saying, who were the Pharisees? And it's the first major book on Pharisees that, that's been written in about 20 years, trying to recover who might the Pharisees be. So if you look at the New Testament, it's like looking at political discourse and the Pharisees are members of the other party for which you did not vote, mm -hmm. but they would not see themselves Right. in that picture. So how were they seen by rabbinic literature? How were they seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls? When Paul trots out his credential, you know, as to the law of Pharisee, I'm in Philippians here, he's not saying, boy, was I terrible. He's saying, I was terrific. <laughs> um, now I've got Jesus, and that's the only thing that would be better than being a Pharisee. Right. Right. Um, so let's not bear false witness against our neighbors. Right. Let me ask you about, um, there's a phrase that I've heard you use a lot before, um, which I think is really helpful. Again, the kind of circles that I usually hang out in, we, we, we don't want to kind of embrace this. Uh, we're afraid to embrace this. Uh, you say, do not sacrifice the particulars of your own tradition or your own religion on the altar of sensitivity. And I, you know, I've realized, um, I mentioned to you before we began that Jerusalem Peace Builders is a nonprofit that, that we partner with. They have a Houston office here right near my own. Um, they bring together Jewish, Christian, Muslim youth, mostly from the from the Holy Lands, and uh, but also from the United States to learn about themselves and themselves in relation to their neighbors. And I think one of the things that I've learned uh, as someone who grew up not knowing anyone who was Jewish, um, partly through working with them, and partly through friendships that I've made, you know, in the in the communities in which I've lived, is that I've had to learn a lot about the assumptions that I make about other people. You know, even even when I want to meet like a rabbi uh, who's a colleague, um, you know, I in the past, I would often from my where I'm coming from in my head, I want to assume a much closer relationship than there may actually be. And I, I think of myself as coming from a friendly point of view without being aware of some of the distance that would be there or the wariness from the other side. And um, do you, are you able to help students kind of with that kind of, you know, um, learning how to navigate that kind of, those kind of way through those waters or, it sounds you know like what I'm talking dating. about? Do you know, yeah. I do. It sounds like dating. I had one bad yeah, experience right. and I'm not really sure how to approach this person. Like, hmm. um, yeah, so you, you come in, you don't, rep, you don't represent your tradition, you just represent you. Right. Um, so the, you know, the entire Episcopal tradition, the entire Anglican communion is not sitting on your shoulders. It's kind of signaled by your collar, by the way. Right. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you represent you. And, and it's usually the case where people are sometimes out of step with their tradition anyway. Mm -hmm. So that if and that's particularly the case with Jews, if I don't have an argument with my rabbi once yes. a month, one of us is clearly right. not doing our job. <laughs> um, 
so it's just a matter of being open. So what do you think about this? You know, am I presuming that you keep kosher? Well, that may not be the case. Right. Am I presuming that you actually agree with everything in the creeds or might you take them as metaphor, which a, a couple of Episcopalians I know mm -hmm. do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so you say the words, but do you believe them? Not necessarily, but it, it's it's good to say because ritual is a good thing. So you have to get to know each other and, and you come in with a sense of humility because you don't know. This is me with the caller. You know, what does it mean? Yeah. I, right. It's my first lecture lesson in interfaith relations is we presume stuff that turns out to be wrong. Right. Yes. Right. And we have to have the, the ability to ask questions, even if we may sound stupid, because that's the only way we're going to learn. Um, yeah, so I we, think that's the other thing I've learned, like to be to be brave, to ask what I'm really wondering about. Like, it's, it's OK to ask a question. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, which is why visiting other people's houses of worship for a, a religious service is fine. And it's not like, oh, the Jews are coming, so we can't use this hymn or something like yes. that. So Let's see, that's, the, that's where a lot of people fall back into that kind of thing, again, to not be themselves, um, which is really not, um, uh, I mean, people want to be in relationship with you as you are, right? I mean, Absolutely. And I don't want people watering stuff down. Yes. So if, if you were to come to, if I knew that a group of Episcopalians were to come to my synagogue, which in fact, before COVID they did, because, you know, people were welcome. And, and you know, plus we feed you at the end. So not only yeah, do you get a service right. snacks, um, uh, it's not like we're, oh, the Episcopalians are here. So let's throw Jesus into the liturgy or make the sign of the cross. We're not going to do that. Right. So why, if a group of Jews comes to your church on a Sunday morning, are you going to say, oh, well, let, let's not bless people in the name of Jesus or, you know, right. do the sign of the cross? I mean, that's that's dumb. Right. That would seem strange. Right. It, it, it's it, Be proud Christians. Go out right. and do it. And, and <laughs> don't don't insist on, oh, let's do, oh, God of Israel praise because it sounds kind of Jewish. I mean, sure. just the way you would yeah. normally do from the hymnal. <laughs> Well, speaking of questions, we do have some questions from uh, folks who are listening. Uh, one, uh, one is from a member of Palmer. We call ourselves Palmers, by the way, um, which uh, is a family name, but it also has, uh, you know, by, uh, by coincidence, uh, historical references to uh, Christians who would go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and um, bring back a palm branch as a sign that they had, that they had done that. Uh, but this uh, Palmer is actually a, so you, you just recently retired from Vanderbilt. I did. Is that correct? In August. So this is from a Vanderbilt alum, uh -huh. this question. Uh, Vanderbilt's Divinity School has a very special history with the civil rights movement. I'd love to hear your perspectives on the common threads in Christianity and Judaism with respect to civil rights activism. It's a wonderful question. Um, one of the, for me, one of the brilliant things about the civil rights movement and people who were preachers in that movement is they knew their Old Testament and they went to that Old Testament um, from, from quoting Amos in terms of justice rolling down like waters to, to quoting the Exodus material. They knew that stuff and they didn't find it for the most part necessary to make Judaism look bad in order to make Jesus look good. I mean, it's from Martin Luther King and Howard Thurman and all those wonderful people who were, who were basic there. Um, and there was a very close relationship between the majority Jewish community and the people inv invested in civil rights. I mean, some rabbis in the a, a college campus rabbis, Hillel rabbis who went with freedom riders and brought their fellow Jewish students with them. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with, with Martin Luther King, although I think he got X'd from the movie Selma. Um, uh, I'm related by marriage to a man named Mickey Schwerner, who was one of the three civil rights workers uh, who wound up in a rock quarry in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that was formative for my family. So that's one of my earliest childhood memories is when Mickey went missing. Um, and we've lost some of those connections. So they're still there. But as times have gone on, um, Black Lives Matter originally um, had a, a plank in the platform, which was um, uh, anti-Zionist. And that caused some strains. Questions about quotas in universities caused some strains. Um, negative comments about Jews and Judaism by prominent Black leaders, uh, less within the Christian community than somebody like Louis Farrakhan, caused strains. So we've lost that closer connection. I think we've lost the close connection that we had in the 1960s. Um, and it's because we've become self-interested. Um, because we really don't know how to do allyship very well. Um, we're terrible at listening. Um, Jews are particularly bad at listening, I think, by the way. <laughs> if, if you have something to say, I don't need for you to finish the sentence. I'm in there already. 
Um, well, I, I often tell people though that we need some some Jewish teachers to 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 tell American Christians how to argue well, though, which is something we're we're afraid to do well. I mean, we do it badly, but uh, you know that's a different problem than the list thing. But. Um, I think Jews should be um, as invested in civil rights um, as any other group because we know what it's like to be treated by a government uncivilly. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is just it, people have their own agendas. So here's one thing to consider. Um, I've, I've been with a number of Jewish groups that are interested in outreach for racial reconciliation. Um, that's less of a concern, Jewish Christian, for mm -hmm. the black church, at least my friends in the black church, than like, let's go talk to the Jews. That's not their concern. Their concern is economic justice. And their concern is, um, I've been teaching, by the way, in a maximum security prison for 20 years. So their, their, their concern is the, the overrate of um, uh, young black men being imprisoned. Um, their concern is stereotypes that are still continuing. Jewish Christian relations are not really high on the list. Right. And here's a point where the Jewish community needs to do a lot more allyship. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, I think, need to pay more attention. And this is something that I've been doing to black preaching particularly as black ministers start going to predominantly white schools and they pick up some of that unfortunate Marcionism. That Marcy that we were talking about earlier, yeah, yeah. right. Um, and I'm seeing some of that trickle down into the black church and that's not helpful either. Um, so how do we listen better to each other and how do we work for the common good? That's interesting that you mentioned that, that observing some of that more recently, because I do think of um, you know, not not as a historian of this, but I I, I, some, I, I I think of black preaching historically as more rooted in the Old Testament than than uh, a lot of Christian preaching. It in is. The States. It is. Yeah, the Old Testament stuff is fine. It's the Jesus right. stuff where that. Oh, let's. I see what Jesus you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Testament. Got it. And yeah. the other thing, right? The other thing to consider here, and it's, and it's a very important consideration, is that there are BIPOC Jews, there are Black Jews, there are uh -huh. Asian Jews, there are Indigenous right. Jews. Um, and, and they get caught in, the, in this, you know, mm -hmm. what, what if we're fighting against each other? And, and then how do we make sure that they're, they're embraced by the Black community on the one hand, which has all this Jesus-y stuff in it, um, and that they can be embraced by the Jewish community on the other hand, which is predominantly um, Eastern European. Mm -hmm. so, so everybody's got work to do. Uh, there's another question from uh, another Palmer thinking about American Christianity that, you know, obviously within American Christianity, there's this strong strain of um, literalism with regard to reading the Bible. And then it just, you know, it causes lots of wrestling with other parts of the of the Christian church in the United States. Uh, are there to what extent are there similar beliefs in Judaism? I mean, obviously, you know, there are different traditions. There's lots of different ways of reading the same things, even within Judaism. But are, is that also uh, one of the one of the things that people struggle with within Judaism? I found it to be less of a problem mm -hmm. uh, because even in ultra orthodoxy, um, where stuff really is literal. I mean, you know, the world was created mm -hmm. in six days, and there there was an Adam and Eve, two naked people running around talking to a snake in the garden. Um, they never quite stopped there. And that's where some of my fundamentalist Christian friends stop. I mean, that's it. I believe it. That's the end right. of it. Um, the rabbinic tradition is always going to say, so what? This happened. What do we learn from it? Um, this happened. How do we understand it? Mm -hmm. Oh, Adam and Eve were standard rabbinic reading. We're shown the door of repentance. Right? Yeah. So we move on. And that's what I do with my fundamentalist students. And I've had them through the years. So you want to believe all this stuff really happened? Terrific. I have no problem with that. What does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. And I will say the same thing to them when it comes to Christianity. You believe that Jesus rose from the dead? That's great. Good for him. What does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. Like, does it mean that bodies are important because he comes back in the body rather than as like, you know, some sort of spirit without a body? Mm -hmm. Well, if bodies are important. Do you, do you know what your cholesterol count is? Are you making sure that other people have decent health care? Um, What's your funeral going to look like? Is, something is that like that. Of, you start you know? planning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you believe in the incarnation, um, then it also means that bodies are important because it means that right. God, in effect, condescends to take on human flesh. So are you making sure that that human flesh is important to you? And it's everybody's human flesh, not just yours or people who look like you. And it also means that God, second part of the Trinity, was housed in a womb. Are you taking care of pregnant people and making sure that they have good health care? Mm -hmm. So 
take that stuff. If you take it literally, that's fine. I have no argument with that. But if it doesn't cash out, then, you know, go believe in the giant spaghetti monster. Mm-hmm. It's got to have a meaning beyond it happened. Yeah, it there's a lot of there's a lot of arguments you see certainly within Christianity about Genesis that never get to the meaning of the words at all. Like it's about something else, um, and you never you never get to that. Um, yeah, and and then it, in some cases, unfortunately, it becomes a litmus test for fidelity. Mm-hmm. Um, if I don't believe something literally, does that make me a bad Christian or a non-Christian? Um, and I, I don't think that's where Jesus was focused. I mean, his focus is on ethics and getting to live, getting his followers to live as if, as if they've already got one foot in the kingdom of heaven. It's not a faith test. I mean, the church was smart to put Matthew right at the beginning. That sheep and the goat stuff, Sermon on the Mount stuff, oh, that's good to go. But that's, that's not about those who say, Lord, Lord, it's about those who do the right. will of the Father. Well, let me ask you another question related to, um, you know, kind of different beliefs within the same tradition. Uh, and this is something that I think I think a lot of Christians are very curious about because we don't know much about it. Uh, and then we hear something, you know, we're like, gosh, I'd, I'd like to learn more about that. The, the Jewish view of the afterlife. Well, I've already I shouldn't say the Jewish view of the afterlife, <laughs> Jewish views of the afterlife. Um, uh, and the, per, the Palmer who mentioned this said, uh, you know, in, in his own reading of, of the Old and New Testaments, you know, the, the, a lot of the details are kind of ambiguous, just a little bit fuzzy, you know, the, the more you get into that realm. But but within Judaism, uh, you know, I think Christians are more concerned about this than Jews are. But we so we really want to know, like, what are you struggling with here or not? <laughs> yeah, well, it's not that. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is pretty fuzzy in your Old Testament, mm-hmm. Artanach. You start getting more clear material on life after death in, in the Hellenistic period, particularly with the book of Daniel, which was written around 165 or so BC, is relatively late. Um, at the time of Jesus, most Jews in Judea and the Galilee believed in resurrection of the dead, and they did so primarily because it was a Pharisaic promulgated idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see that even in the New Testament. Right. Um, uh, Josephus, by the way, our first century Jewish historian, says they're listening to the Pharisees. And he's a priest, and he's not a Pharisee, and he thinks the Pharisees are a little uppity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they, people should be listening to the priest, says jo- Josephus. Ha ha, people listening to priests. What a concept. <laughs> um, uh, in... in um, uh, in the New Testament, you frequently get references to a group called the Sadducees, right. and the tagline is the Sadducees, those who say there's no resurrection, mm-hmm. which makes them the outliers because everybody else did. As we are wont to say in the biblical studies business, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection, and that's what made them Sadducee. <laughs> I've never actually heard that before, but yes, I get it. And you were probably lucky. Um, <laughs> in, in the story in John 11, which is the raising of Lazarus, right? So Lazarus has been dead for four days, so he's really dead. Um, And Jesus gets there, and Martha, I love Martha, by the way, she's like my favorite character. She's got Mm -hmm. such a mouth. Um, You know, she (laughs) says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then she calms down and says, you know, whatever you ask, Mm -hmm. it'll be fine. Um, And Jesus says, do you believe in the resurrection? And Martha says, yes, I believe in the resurrection on the last day. Standard Jewish end of the world stuff. The end of the Messianic age begins, everybody comes back from the dead. There's a final judgment, whatever happens, happens. And, and you figure you're going to live under your own vine and fig tree and the lion will lie down with the lamb and everything will be, you know, cool. Um, by the time you get to the mission of this compendium of religious law, rabbinic law, about the year 200 or so, um, they've written the Sadducees out and they actually find resurrection of the dead proclaimed in Genesis. Now you have to, you can't, it's not like where's Waldo, right? right? We, we, there's resurrection <laughs> in chapter 38. Um, you have to put on rabbinic lenses and they, they show you how they can find that. So resurrection of the dead remains on the books in conservative Judaism and Orthodox Judaism. The reform movement, which began as an enlightened movement in the late 1800s in Germany, um, tossed resurrection of the dead. It was superstitious. It also sounded a little Christian. Um, And they actually changed the liturgy, which in the in the traditional service blesses God three times a day. uh, 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 Who gives life to the dead. Okay. And they change the liturgy to Michaye, Chaye, you can hear like Lechaim, Michaye Hakol, who gives life to all. So resurrection goes out of Reform Judaism. It's crept back in, by the way, because some Reform Jews thought it was a pretty good idea. So now they've got options in their prayer book. In my Orthodox synagogue, resurrection of the dead is proclaimed and it is believed. What do Jews believe? Mm-hmm. Depends upon the Jew that you ask. 
What happened as time went on, and that's part of that, those siblings begin to be separated right. or the common, the common root and then the different branches. The more the church talked about salvation and heaven and hell, the more the synagogue said, let's focus on sanctification in this world and we'll let God worry about the afterlife. That our job is just to be the best people we can be enacting what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. So all this like heaven and hell stuff kind of drops out of rabbinic Judaism. You can see that same distinction. The more the church talked about virginity and continence and celibacy, the more the Jewish tradition said, get married, make babies. Mm -hmm. So you begin to see the self-definition over against. That, no, that's a fascinating trend. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I did not know till like a, a presentation here at Palmer about, you know, for example, the influence that Protestantism had had on like the Reformed Jewish, you know, like, you know, just, just the way you gather even or something like that. And, and then so similar to what you were just saying, even the use of the Ten Commandments, um, which used to be in the old um, Anglican liturgies would have been said at the beginning of the worship service every Sunday. Um, now it's optional. You, there's a way to do that. But, but that is, is it true that the more common that became in, in early Christian circles, then, then it just kind of drops out in terms of use, a frequency of use in the Jewish liturgies? You know what I mean? Like, so, so one is reacting to the other. Um, there's certainly some of that. I mean, you can see the distinctions in the way that Jews and Protestants and Catholics number the Ten Commandments. So yes, we all agree that there are ten of them, but yeah. you know, like, but what verse goes with what, yeah. and how do we understand stuff? And in the New Testament, you can see Jesus playing with it. So when he right. meets the fellow that's called the rich young ruler, he's rich in one text, young in another, and a ruler in another. Um, <laughs> he throws in "Do not defraud," which is technically technically not one of the ten. So you kind of mix and match, you know. Sure. Um, and what does it mean not to make a graven image? Yeah, well, I, I suspect in your church there are a number of them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, the uh, we talked earlier about you know the, the fact that we you know, we're obviously talking about Jewish Christian relations and reading the same texts, uh, and we won't delve into to the relationship to Islam. But is there anyone that you know of? Someone asked a question. Do you know of anyone who is doing that kind of work from an is, uh, Islamic Muslim perspective, yeah. you know, comparing texts and things like that. And you may, you right. may not, but. One of the reasons, in fact, a major reason that um, after I retired from Duke, I re uh, from Vanderbilt, I retired from Vanderbilt on August 15th. And on August 16th, I took the job at Hartford, which is rebranded about two weeks ago, Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Because Hart's, Hartford's focus is on Jewish Christian Muslim relations. And Vanderbilt does wonderful stuff in racial reconciliation and wonderful stuff in LGBTQI plus concerns. Mm -hmm. But it really is a Christian divinity school and it doesn't have that, that interreligious conversation in such a robust way. And I wanted to go to Hartford because that's where they're doing it um, with a number of faculty members there. Um, there's also a very good center in Baltimore, um, uh, which is invested in Jewish Christian Muslim relations. So it's becoming more common. The problem in doing it is we there's a difference between Jewish Christian relations on the one hand and then Islam over here. Because Jews and Christians are sort of wrestling over that same text, whether we call it the Old Testament or the Tanakh, they're still basically the same stories. And the Quran uses the same characters like Adam and Eve and, and Joseph and Moses and, and by the way, Jesus and Mary. That's right, yeah. But the stories are different. Mm -hmm. So it might be easier because again, we're not quite that sibling stuff. It's like Islam right. is sort of like a cousin. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is that it's part of academic training. So if, if you get a degree in Bible, you are expected to know Hebrew and Greek, but you are not expected to know Correct. Arabic. Right. And if you get a degree in Quran, you are not expected to know Hebrew mm -hmm. and Greek. So one of the things that needs to be done in order to further this Jewish Christian Muslim relation is people ramping up in the languages that they do not have. Great. This is great. Uh, do you have do you have any last word you'd like to share with us before we um, if if people who are listening in have additional questions that didn't get uh, asked or answered, or if I said something that strikes them as is wrong or in need of elaboration, I would certainly welcome them to email me your Palmerites 
have such a fabulous program and I am honored to be among your guests. And if I can be of any help to a congregation that cares about education and cares about Jewish Christian relations and cares about race, race relations and, and gender sexuality, I, I'd, be del I'd be honored and delighted if you and your congregation would remain in touch with me because I think you're a congregation worth supporting. Thank you so much, that's wonderful. This Thank is Roger Hutchison yeah. coming through as a voice. Um, I'm actually having a hard time turning my video screen back on. So forgive me for that. Um, but I want to thank you, AJ, for an incredible um, conversation. Neil, uh, you both did a wonderful job. And I am in a room with folks, and we have thoroughly enjoyed um, watching from here. I received a text from someone um, saying that they wish you they had had you as a professor. Um, and, and it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. There's lots out there. So um, I want to, again, I want to thank you for your generosity and your time with us this evening. I also want to, and I'm sorry, I am, I'm this voice kind of echoing in, but I want to share that our upcoming uh, Great Wednesday webinar, our next one is December the 15th, 2021 with Joy Harjo. Um, Joy Harjo is the 23rd United States Poet Laureate and the first Native American to hold this position and the only the second person to serve three terms in this role. And so we are honored and excited to have her join us. And again, I wanna thank everyone. AJ, once again, thank you and congratulations on your new role and, and failing at retirement. And uh, <laughs> we look forward to being in touch. So thank you Thanks so much. Good. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Take care. Night night. Good night, bye-bye. <laughs>